This is a talk about solving some of the thorny problems that some users hit. And for, unfortunately, they hit it at the wrong time after they've been very happy with Postgres for a long time. And then suddenly they get into you know these problems. Vacuuming is one of them. So um, this is a talk about how some of these problems can be solved and a real world implementation on solving uh, these problems for Postgres. So uh, Alexander is a, um, OK, very quickly, Oriole, Oriole is Baltimore Orioles, the bird, you know, and it's a bird that shows up during springtime. So we're thinking like, oh, this could be a nice springtime for Postgres, future things to look forward to. Okay. Um, and of course, birds are dragons also, right? <laughs> um, so very quickly, Alexander, he's, he's a Postgres a long time committer and a contributor. He has made a lot of uh, very interesting improvements uh, to Postgres that everyone uses today. Um, and uh, me, I'm a community advocate person. I've been helping Alexander a little bit, uh, helping him give these talks sometimes in person virtually uh, as a hybrid talk. Um, many, many years ago when I first was an undergraduate student. The first database I found on a VAX was Ingress, and so, and uh, I, then I decided I wanted to become a database person, and that was. Anyway, so why? Uh, right? What's uh, what's the basic problem we see? Uh, if you go to DB engines, you know Postgres is beloved, very uh, popular. People love it, and all of that. Uh, but if you look at that list, there's more than 300 databases, right? And who really needs 300 databases? Most enterprise customers, we see them running anywhere from six to 10 databases. That's pretty bad. But then every month, someone comes up with a new idea and they build yet another database. And, you know, just creating a zoo of things. So, um, again, why open source? A lot of users are. Uh, moving over to Postgres because they found it. They realize it does a lot of things really, really well for what they need. And this quote is from Mike Olson. I, I put him here as a co-creator of Postgres because he was the first one who converted the original Lisp code at Berkeley that was the Postgres prototype into C. And then it became usable as a actually fast database. So uh, he was also the co-founder of Cloudera. He talked about customers just don't want their data trapped in something that they have to pay for every time they try to use it. And Postgres has now become the default database engine where it's safe for you to keep your data because you can move it around and you don't need anyone's permission to run it in a, in a new environment. Um, then uh, Stephen O'Grady, he's a, he's a, um, a developer um, analyst and uh, recently he wrote a blog about there's way too many databases and everyone is starting to migrate back to relational databases, right? People are falling out of love with NoSQL databases. They found out it does certain things well, but then now everyone is trying to add SQL onto this new database that they, that they said did not require SQL. And then people are just deciding to move back uh, to Postgres and relational databases because it's been proven they can do a lot of things and they're getting better and better. So. Um, uh, this is just one of the, the original paper about Postgres to talk about how different storage engines can be used and different types of hardware and all that. I won't go into many details about that. But the idea for Oriole DB was that can we go back to the original design principles of Postgres that was, it was extensible and you can put in different types of models, different types of data types, different types of query types, and, and uh, do that. Um, yeah. You know, nowadays we just don't have DBAs anymore. We have data engineers and data platform engineers, and we have data scientists. So the world of databases has really, really grown. And people have a lot of tools, right? Uh, the problem is that if certain tools only work with certain types of databases, then you end up with, the, again, a multiplication of all these tools, and it becomes a zoo. So what if Postgres could be like a power tool, right? with these adapters where you can do different kinds of things in your environment. And Postgres has the potential of doing that. It's very good, and it can even be better. So, so what can be done? Right? 
So uh, these are some of the things that have been done in the cloud. Aurora is the most popular example where the Amazon team just took the storage layer of Postgres and replaced it with something completely their own proprietary design for their environment. Um, this does improve a lot of things in Postgres, but it's not open source, so it has no effect on the community edition, right? It's just something that's locked away, only available in Amazon. Um, Azure went slightly a different way. They acquired Citus, and they decided to build uh, Citus into their service. And, uh, and about a month ago, Citus announced that everything was going to be open source, not just the extension itself, but all the more proprietary enterprise features that they had, they decided to, you know, all the open source. But again, that's an extension that's building on top of Postgres. It doesn't do anything to the Postgres engine itself that moves the state of the art forward. And then GCP recently came out with Alloy SQL, which is basically trying to do what Aurora did, but doing it the Google way using Google's massive infrastructure and all the things that are hidden in Google Cloud. Again, those things are not uh, open source. So open source efforts, um, Yugabyte has been around for a while. Um, I, was, I worked with the Yugabyte founders very uh, early on when they did their first version and they decided they wanted a SQL layer on top of Yugabyte. And instead of building their own SQL, I said, Postgres code is there. Why don't you try to use it, figure out what you can do with it? At that time, pluggable storage engines was an idea, and some of the hooks were starting to appear, but it was not far enough for it to be useful for Yugabyte. So they ended up just doing their own thing. And they did release it, and they made it open source. But again, it's their opinionated model of how a distributed storage engine could work with Postgres, and some of, may, of it may be useful or not. Uh, they are very interested in trying to contribute those ideas back to the community, if it fits and if it makes sense, and that might still happen. Um, CockroachDB, um, I'm from New York. I'm one of the organizers of the New York uh, Postgres uh, meetup. Very early on, they came and showed what they were doing building a Postgres compatible engine. Um, but because they were using Go, it became a completely different animal. And then many years later, they just decided, change the license, it's not really open source. You can ac have access to the code, but because it's all written in Go and Postgres is written in C, there's no real synergy there. Uh, NeonDB is something fairly new but it's not built to modify the Postgres core itself. It works alongside Postgres by taking the wall records and replicating it into S3 and doing all kinds of very interesting things uh, to it. So it is open source, but again, it doesn't try to change the core Postgres. So I'm here to talk about DB, And uh, what DB is really, um, is modifying and enhancing the table access methods framework that's in Postgres so that you can build different types of storage engines that are optimized for different types of infrastructure, different types of storage devices, and also different types of workloads, right? Um, imagine MySQL very early on when it came out, it had MyISM, it was kind of okay, interesting as a database, but not terribly useful. And then when InnoDB came out, suddenly people woke up and said, okay, we have transactions and we have more advanced methods. And then MySQL really took off. So table access methods, hopefully if it can be really mature, uh, it can really change the way Postgres is being used in different places. And it can also give people a way of customizing the Postgres core without actually messing with the Postgres core. And again, Postgres has this extensions mechanism. Ideally, this is a model that should be carried forward and can be very, very powerful. So what DB does is a lot of these things were discussed over time whether Postgres should change things in the core, uh, especially undo logs. Um, uh, most other databases, uh, especially Oracle, has undo logs and redo logs and those mechanisms. And Postgres doesn't because it, it has a different uh, method. So DB implements that. 
Um, it implements some interesting changes in the way the buffer maps are done. And then uh, for wraparound IDs, it uses 64-bit instead of 32-bit. Um, um, so I won't go into too much details here, but if you don't know the difference between undo logs and, and uh, the way Postgres currently does it, um, you can ask questions. I'll, I'll, you know, maybe a couple of people can can volunteer that. Um, but um, um, this turns out maybe a, to be a more efficient way of uh, managing uh, MVCC. Right? Did I got that right, Bruce? by side and you can use it for specific tasks that you need and then all your other data can still be in Postgres. You know, that, that's really the, the benefit of it. Um, and then um, buffer maps. So instead of having a separate buffer map in memory where you have to go through and find out if the blocks are in memory and then you don't find them and then you have to go back to the disk and, and, and load those blocks, um, you know, this this method has a dual pointer, so you can actually go and find the block, and with one scan, you can figure out whether it's on the disk or in memory, and then if it's on the disk, you can you can load it. Um, I can't go into the details uh, on this, but this turns out to be more scalable for larger machines with multiple cores and, and, and more memory, and uh, I'll show some results afterward. Uh, let's talk about some results, right? So, so this was a very infamous blog written by the Uber team. Originally, the Uber team started with MySQL, and then they switched to Postgres, and they went pretty far with it. And then another team came in, and they wanted to do something different, and Postgres somehow didn't fit what they expected. And they wrote this blog about how terrible Postgres was and why they moved to MySQL. This caused a big firestorm in the community because half of the stuff that they wrote about may have just been wrong or misunderstanding. And then the other half were legitimate complaints about the way Postgres worked and why it didn't work for them. So um, yeah, if you, if you, you know, Google Uber Postgres, this is the first thing that comes up. And even though it's about, I think, five years ago, it's still number one hit on Google. You know? So for a lot of people coming new to Postgres, if they just happen to stumble across this, it gives them the wrong impression about whether they should move to Postgres or not. You know? um, so, so Oriel DB kind of solves this problem by you know, the, the design so that you don't have that choppiness uh, that you see over here. And you get a, a much um, higher throughput in that same infrastructure. Yeah. And uh, the same thing down here is that uh, the blue line you can see is very, very choppy. So if you don't want to have performance issues, you have to oversize the storage IOPS that you need in order to get stable performance, right? So, so Oriel DB has a much lower threshold, and so you get much better performance in, um, you know, uh, in the same machine. Um, and then storage efficiency also, this is uh, otherwise 
referred to as, I think in the blog, it referred to as a right bloat on how, you know, as you use Postgres for a long time, um, literature just kind of piles up and then the amount of storage that you're actually using turns out to be higher than what you really need. And then you have to go through some cleanup and things that Robert talked about in his previous talk. Let's see, you remind me for time. So um, this was an experiment that was done and I think by October we'll probably redo the experiment once V15 is ready and then we'll compare it again. But what we were able to do is, is use the obtained storage um, um, uh, device, uh, which is like persistent memory, and treat it as a block device and run you know, uh, uh, databases on it. Um, a few years ago, um, Dr. Stonebreaker was giving like a road tour to talk about databases. At that time, he had just built a new in-memory uh, database and he was talking about everything that you can just throw out of the code and the database architecture when you don't have to deal with spinning disks and all the locking and latching that has to be done, you know. And when he showed the efficiency of the code and what the database was actually doing, about 55% of the database operations had to do with storage devices. And at that time, he kind of hinted that Intel was working on something really interesting, uh, which could be like persistent storage memory where you could use it to store data and you would not have a power down problem. And that given him a grant to do some work with it. So that eventually became what's now known as Optane, right? So um, you can now get Optane devices for like eight terabytes or maybe even 19 terabytes. That's a pretty good size database, you know. Um, so the blue lines, yeah, so the blue line is just uh, PG SQL, and uh, you can see as the number of connections increases, the you know the um, uh, the, uh, the performance uh, nosedive. Right, this is just a PG bench, and then the green line was using Oriole DB on that same device, but through the file system, right? So, you know, just using the OS to talk to the device so that the OS treats it as a storage device. It doesn't know anything about the memory characteristics. And then the red line was treating the device as a block storage device directly and bypassing uh, the operating system. So this creates some interesting use cases where you can take specific tables and lock them into just talking to these devices and then you can get much, much better uh, performance, right? You can So you can leave a lot of the medium level workloads in Postgres traditional uh, engine, and then just the high right workloads, you can aim it towards these new devices, and that reduces what you would need to otherwise get more IOPS from your cloud provider or size bigger machines or get more memory. So this changes uh, you know, the, the economic equation on how you use Postgres. And as you see more and more cloud providers especially SaaS companies, they're using Postgres as the default engine for their, provide, uh, for their customers, right? And a tremendous amount of their overhead costs goes to paying Amazon or Microsoft or whatever because of some of these overheads that Postgres has. If you can reduce that, more people can benefit from it. The economics of using Postgres, you know, just gets better. Any questions I can take are very good. Um, record level walls, again, is a change. Uh, Postgres currently does block level wall, and I think that's tradition for most databases. Uh, there's a little bit, some extra things in here where using rec record level walls made it easier to potentially build a multi-master version of Postgres, where the entire information is on all the other nodes. So when you need to do failover or you need to write to multiple nodes, it becomes easier to deal with that information. So, um, so I think this, this also needs uh, a detailed blog to talk about uh, you know, the benefits uh, of it. And uh, so what are we doing uh, next? So uh, one is that we're, we're tracking Postgres. Um, the extra code that, and hooks that are needed to make Oriole DB work in Postgres, that's not part of core. 
and hopefully that's something you know that can be uh, upstreamed uh, at some point we're working on that so what we did is that took all the code necessary to run Postgres and backported it. Um, uh, Oriel DB was originally designed for version 14. We were able to uh, port it to version 15 and test it working. We were able to also backport it to version 13 because we needed to run it in some cloud provider and they were not ready with version 14 yet. And then we we're also working on version 16. And then we had one potential customer, a large Postgres-based uh, uh, SaaS company, um, because they had just migrated from 9.6 to 12, they were not ready to try anything else. So they said, if you could backport it to 12, we can test it side by side with the same exact workload on traffic and see the benefits of it. And then that would help them decide which was the next version of Postgres they wanted to jump to. Do they want to go to 13? Do they want to go to 14? You know, that's something. And, uh, and because they get a lot of cloud traffic, it would be easy for them to set up a separate Postgres or LDB implementation and just pipe the traffic directly to that and test it and give us some you know, feedback. Um, so there were, there were a couple of patches that were committed uh, in the commit fest. It's ongoing now. Uh, don't have too many details on that at the moment. And then upstreaming Postgres is um, we're trying to contribute some of it into version 16. And uh, um, all the code is in GitHub, so people are running their own PG bench uh, test and giving us feedback and having pull requests and telling us where things don't work. Um, and one thing we are planning on is to work with, again, large companies that are using Postgres to, for them to run it alongside their production environment and give us some performance you know, um, uh, 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 feedback. So, um, so Oriel DB, the uh, storage engine, is all there in GitHub, and it's there in um, in the open. So people are putting in pull requests and reporting issues there. Uh, there's a separate uh, GitHub repo called Postgres, which is our patch version of Postgres that has all the extensions you need. And also over there, you'll find a lot of Docker containers for several operating systems, all the different versions that we're building for. So you can just download the Docker containers and run it, and then trying to you know, build it from source. So um, when we released this, I think it was in February, uh, we made sure at the first release we changed the license to have exactly the same Postgres um, permissive license so that anyone is free to use it on their own. We don't even need to know about it, uh, but of course, people want to use it would come back and ask us for help, you know, because now they're using something that's a little bit different from the community edition. And I think within the first week or so, we got like a thousand stars, and that attracted a lot of attention. It hit number one on Hacker News as something, oh, look, all the things that you thought that Postgres would have problems with, here's an attempt to solve it. So a lot of people are aware of that. And uh, in terms of education, uh, we've done a lot of presentations at, uh, at conferences like, like this one. Um, the second one has been very interesting. What we have done is that we work with certain large um, uh, startups who want to use this. And the way we offer a relationship is that not just to help them understand the code and not just take the code and try to run it themselves, but we also started a coaching program to help them hire engineers and make them into Postgres experts, right? So we're using the code here as a learning lab to train people because our, one of our goals is to expand the number of people who contribute code back. You know, just found like, um, you know, in, in one of the conferences I work on, a lot of customers will come and say, we plan to move to Postgres, we're going to go all in, but we need to hire X, Y, and Z kind of people. Can you help me recruit a Postgres committer or a contributor? In the end, it was just, there's not enough of them, right? So advice um, customers like that or users say, hire good engineers who want to work for your company, and we can teach them how to become Postgres hackers. And that's a more viable way of expanding the universe of people who are just not just using Postgres, but are knowledgeable about Postgres, and then can become productive uh, contributors. 
uh, office hours, we haven't really gotten that started yet, but we're hoping as uh, Oriel DB starts to get more public traction, uh, we can do like uh, every Thursday, you know, an one hour thing about Postgres code, how to commit code, how to write code, how to understand code, and what the release cycle is. Just again, try to train people so that they can start to think about becoming part of the Postgres community as contributors. Um, these are some of the few online activities. Um, let's see here. Um, right. So um, yeah. So these are YouTube. So if you if you just put Alexander Korotkov on YouTube, you'll find two people. One guy who's into games, and then the other one's Alexander. So put Postgres as your search thing, and you'll find a lot of past presentations. Uh, but the really good one was the one that we did with the uh, Timescale Community Day, where we talked about, because Timescale is probably one of the most impressive new databases that is built on top of Postgres using Postgres extensions mechanism. You know, And again, back in the day when they first started, they managed to get everything that they wanted done. But now as they're trying to stretch the state of the art, they also wish they could go in and modify some aspects of Postgres to make it easier for them to do some of these new things. So time scale, you know, they, 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 last time the CEO spoke, they committed to hiring about a dozen engineers and paying them just to be Postgres contributors. You know, so this is the level of investment new companies are making into contributing and making Postgres better. And, uh, um, yeah, so, and, and last year, I, I, I'm, I think there's probably a recording of, of the original talk that Alexander gave. Um, I would uh, advise you to go and uh, check that out. And then we gave a talk at Postgres, uh, Postgres Vision, uh, which was in June, and uh, Alexander had like the last talk, and the title was called The Future of Postgres. So this is not necessarily the future of Postgres, but an idea of some of the things that might affect the future of Postgres. And this is one way to do it. Uh, what else is coming in the future? Um, yeah, so this was a challenge that Dr. Stonebreaker gave at the Postgres Vision keynote. He just said, like, Postgres is too complicated. It takes too much experience and too much knowledge for people to run it well. Try to simplify it, right? And one way to do it is that instead of having to tune every aspect of Postgres, you can have specific modules that are designed for specific environments. And those should not need to be tuned, right? Out of the box, they should come in with better defaults so that you can just use it without having uh, to be, you know, a 10-year Postgres expert. Um, some of the other big challenges uh, we see that are wicked problems, connection pooling. Um, Postgres is probably one of the few databases where there's five or six different connection poolings. Uh, every other database has just decided to just build it as part of their core. Um, and then people just don't have to think about it. Just turn it on, and uh, you know they have you know you don't have problems with too many connections. Uh, Multi-threading is something that many community people have talked about. Should we continue Postgres's uh, process uh, architecture, or should we move to multi-threading? And uh, a couple people want to try to solve this, and uh, we are hoping that we can contribute something to that. And then. Um, you know, sharding is something also the community is working on, and, and our position is that in order for sharding to be really successful, Postgres as a core engine also has to be much, much better, right? Because when you have a thousand engines running and trying to orchestrate and manage all of that is going to become a, a worse problem. So core problems need to be fixed so that the future of scale out Postgres can be even better. and. Um, I was talking to some uh, people who work at banks, and um, data encryption is still a very, very, you know, uh, most of the IT departments are satisfied with encrypting at the file level, uh, at the file system level, but the DBAs prefer to have encryption at the application model. You know, so these are other big challenges we see that um, as we try to evangelize Postgres and build out the community of mo developers, Hopefully, more people will be able to come in and, and contribute towards this and accelerate some of the development. So um, this, is a, this is a startup I'm working with. They built a really nice cloud-based service where you can take a, a sample database and run it in a specific cloud, and it will do all the math and show you what's the 
uh, cost of that cloud service, running a specific database, and your cost per query, cost per operation, and things like that. So we're hoping to use them as a partner and to put Oriel DB as an engine that they can deploy across multiple clouds and show the difference and the benefits. So that's a, that's a that's a cool <laughs> thing. Um, and um, and then again, you know, the best way to deliver a database is to deliver it as a database as a service. So we're working with a company called ScaleGrid. And um, what was really nice about that is that uh, you could just go ScaleGrid. You can uh, turn on a 30-day trial. You get a Nano uh, instance, and that same service runs on everything from Digital Ocean. Uh, to Oracle Cloud and and uh, Amazon, Google, Azure. It also runs on uh, VMware. But you could go online and try it out. And we have like a one and a half pager where you can log in with SSH as a super user, just go in, shut down the Postgres instance running, delete the binaries, install Oriel DB, and bring it back up. And voila, you have an Oriel DB database as a service. Right, so it's a quick way for anyone to try things out. Um, you can reach Alexander at OrielDB.com. You can reach me at Postgres at ThinkX.com um, if you are interested in in trying this out. You know, and we would uh, we would love to uh, work with people um, to to test OrielDB. Uh, and uh, and that is the end of my talk. I'm on I'm ThinkX on Twitter. And uh, normally I give this talk with Alexander online, but it was a little bit shaky whether how well the Wi-Fi would work, so I'm kind of flying solo. But um, if you have questions, uh, more technical questions, that you want to learn more about it, everything's on GitHub. They're design documents explaining the architecture, design decision, and things like that. All the code is out there. Uh, Feel free to go in and put in an issue if you have a question about some feature or you read the documentation and you're interested in learning more about some things like that. You know, everything is there on GitHub. So I hope uh, you will give it a try. And if you're interested in participating or contributing or learning more about the code or maybe even trying it in your environment, be happy to talk to you about it. <laughs>